What's up, guys? Coach Matt and YouGoProBaseball.com. I'm here with Omir Santos, former Major League catcher. And uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the difference in pro baseball, minor league baseball, major league baseball, since you played at basically every level of baseball that you can play at. Uh, and I just want to provide some clarification, the ins and outs, the behind the scenes for some of these people watching. Um, because for me, I didn't know growing up how it was in there. And nowadays, I feel like everyone has a cousin who played triple A baseball. <laughs> I got a cousin who played triple A baseball, but really have no concept of how everything works in pro baseball. So if you don't mind, I got some questions for you that you can enlighten us with. First, take us through um, how you got into pro, uh, pro baseball. Were you drafted? Were you picked up as a free agent? How did that whole process work for you? I was in uh, Puerto Rico and a friend of mine was playing in college in San Luis and he was the only Puerto Rican in that college. And the coach from that college said, hey, I want more players like you. And he said, oh, do you got some? He said, yeah, I got some. I got some friends that can play. Say, but I re they really can play. And the coach came to Puerto Rico and did like a small tryout, like with 10 of us. And then he picked five. And I was in those five. And I went to college in San Luis, Missouri, small school. I was there for two years, and then I got drafted by the Yankees. But that's how it all started. Wow. So then you get into pro baseball. You're drafted by the Yankees. Uh, where do you go first, short season A, or did you go to rookie ball? How, so you're, what, probably 20 years old at the time? I was 19, yes, 19. Okay. So you went to short season first? Short or? season. Okay. Yes, I, I skipped uh, rookie, but I went to short season in New York, uh, Staten Island. I remember they got that new big stadium, and it's still there. It's really nice. And our first season was in there, and I said, damn, this is going to be like this new stadium, but, I mean, it's changed. Then we went to, I mean, the next level, and it was a shitty part. <laughs> I said, damn, we're just going backwards. And, I mean, through the whole minor league system, I mean, it's not, it's not easy. I mean, people think that when you sign, it's, everything is easy, but it's not. It's not. So Tell me about uh, like your first couple years in the minors. Tell me about the the travel and tell me about the food. The travel is is hard. It's hard. It gotta be twenty five, not twenty five, maybe thirty people in one bus with trainers, coaches, and everything, and double up next to the guy, and you're traveling thirteen, fourteen hours, and you're playing. And then next thing, three days later, you're in that bus again to the next city, playing the same day. I mean, it's not easy. And then the food, I mean, you're not eating healthy. I mean, you have to eat whatever you can find open at that time. I mean, I can say that the best food and the best friend of the player is peanut butter and jelly. Mm -hmm. I mean, peanut butter and jelly, it was. AKA minor league steak. That's what you call peanut yes. butter and jelly. Anytime I'm making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, I say I'm, make, I'm eating a minor league steak. Exactly. Because that yep. was like gold yep. for the minor leaguers. Yep. So in, in, uh, when I was playing, I'm sure it was similar when you were playing, we had a clubby. It was a club, it's called a clubby, clubhouse manager, and they would uh, wash our uniform, and they would also get the food. Um, take us through the different levels of the minors. Um, did you have to pay dues to them? How did that work? And how did the food and uh, services that you got get better as you went up? Yeah, I mean, as you went up, the service was better. I mean, you can I mean, you're going to have some clubbies. I mean, I don't want to put any clubby out there, you know, but, I mean, even in double-A AA or triple-A, even in higher, you're going to find good clubbies, that they put good food out there. And on the other hand, you can find triple-A clubbies that the food is bad. I mean, it's going to be maybe one or two, but, I mean, you always find those people. But, I mean, besides that, Double A and Triple A, I mean, the food was great. I mean, Triple A, I mean, it's the closest to the big league, but it doesn't, you, you can compare Triple A with the big leagues. It's a huge difference, huge gap, huge gap. <laughs> so to give you a perspective, and the way I understand it to work is we would pay the clubby, I, f I think it was every paycheck, right? So every two weeks, you would pay the clubby a certain amount of money, and they would use that money to buy food and buy laundry detergent and all this stuff. 
So basically, they had control over what kind of food you were eating. If they wanted to make a little more money, they would buy the crappy food. Yeah. If they wanted to be nice and get some good food, they'd spend more money. Um, so it all depends. And then you should tip them as well. We would tip them as well. I believe it was like $4 in the lower levels, $4 a day. Um, and then it got up to like $13 in AAA, right? A day that you would pay the clubby. So that's why, typically why it got better too, because you're paying more. Yep. And you also got paid more. Yep. Um, so t tell us the difference between the minor leagues now, AAA, and the major leagues. What was it like in the clubhouse? What was the food like? How much were you paying a day? No, first of all, I mean, the pay is a huge gap. Huge gap. You, you come in from AAA from paying $13, $14 a day from, I think, on these dates on the big leagues. I think the cheapest that you can pay a day, I think it's $70 wow. a day. So it's a huge gap. But, I mean, the food that they put there is amazing. I mean, anything you can think, anything from steak, from shrimp, lobster, anything. Sometimes when the game is done, you have like five, I mean, different kind of food. I mean, five pasta, rice, I mean, steak, I mean, anything you can think. And if they don't have it there, you ask for it, they bring it to you. I mean, it's a huge difference. I mean, a huge difference on the money and the food, but I mean, it's worth it. I mean, because from anything you can think, I mean, candy bar, I mean, ice cream, I mean, anything, anything, I mean, like I said, if it wasn't there, hey, I, I mean, I have a craving for, I mean, I don't know, a tuna salad, I didn't, wait a minute, 10 minutes, it was there. I mean, anything you can think. So I didn't have the opportunity to play in any um, big league games during the regular season, but I had a few opportunities to play in spring training. Um, and then also before they broke, we played at Arizona, and I remember going in there and just thinking it was like a convenience store. It's literally like a convenience yes. store with no clerk, nobody taking your money. <laughs> Go <laughs> grab whatever you wanted. And and I mean, coolers full of drinks, yes. uh, candy, like a candy, a whole candy aisle, stuff in the bathrooms, shavers, razors, deodorants, uh, uh, toothpaste, whatever you could think of. Whatever you can think of. Whatever you can think whatever of. You can think. Even uh, those uh, razor mastery or whatever, the, the, the the good ones. The fill up, you know, you yeah. throw it away, they have it. And anything you can think of, anything, anything. So now you go from AAA, which is, I, back when I was playing was, um, I want to say, like 2,300 to 3,200. Unless you were on the 40-man roster, you were making a little bit more. What are you making when you get into the big leagues? When I was in, in the minors and I got called up, I remember it was uh, September 3rd, I think. And then... I was waiting for the fifth thing, and then when they give me the check, I was out there, I was telling my wife, then we're rich. It was a huge gap. I mean, it was back in the days, now this day, it's been going up. It go up, I mean, as a, a living expensive thing go up, they go up every year, so it might go up. So right now, when I was in the big leagues, my first year, I think it was, the minimum was three, 75, almost 400. Now in these days, five something. Wow. Five, 530, something like that. It wow. keeps going up, the minimum. That's crazy. So every paycheck, every 15, they will come, I mean, maybe 28,000. Every 15, yes. So you're going in your lot, and was it the same in the major leagues as the minor leagues where like, I remember going and the paycheck was in your locker on the on the 15th. Same major leagues, you go up there and there's a big old fat check up No, there. these days, I mean, a lot of these, I mean, uh, organization make you have like a direct deposit. So Sometimes, just, yeah, I mean, you barely see it now, the paycheck. They give it to you, it's not, it's not their really paycheck, but they deposit in your account. So now I've heard stories about guys, some of the big name guys, and you know a lot of them, um, who would go and they would get checks in their locker for crazy number, not only for their the, the contract that they signed, but also for um, other deals that they were signing. So they might get a check in their locker for 40, 50, 60, 70, crazy uh, amounts of money in their locker for different things. Can you talk about some of the crazy things you saw? I'm going to say that I, see, I saw this thing. I'm not going to mention any name, but my friend, we were... We weren't in the big league yet. 
we were playing, we were in a um, sprint training with a team. And then my friend went to this guy, they were a good friend. Hey, he said, let, let me see uh, uh, your paycheck. Because they, he used to, all his paycheck, they were direct deposit, but in, in spring training, they gave him all, the, all his paycheck. I mean, there wasn't, nothing was paper, but they saved it for him. Say, let me see one. I say, no, no, man, you don't show that, you don't show that. Can I see, man, let me see what you get every 15 days. Right. No, man, I said, okay, go, go to my locker and you'll see it. And don't, and my friend went to his locker and opened that check, and he said, I almost get a heart attack. <laughs> it was 2.3. 2.3 million dollars. Every 15 days. Every 15 days. Yes. 2.3 million dollars. Yes. Wow. <laughs> that's crazy. He said, I stopped breathing for a second when I saw that. I said, too, that's too many series. He said, how much is that? I said, 2.3 every 15 days. That's what you get? Oh. I said, yes. Wow. <laughs> wow, that is crazy. So now let's talk about, <laughs> let's talk about um, some of the differences in deals from the minor leagues to the major leagues, meaning like when I was in the minor leagues, uh, some guys got deals, they got equipment deals or whatever, if they were high round draft picks. I didn't get any deals. I had an agent though, and he would send me glove and sliders and shirts and pants, whatever I needed. Um, did you have any deals in the minors? And if so, how did they differ from some of the deals that you had in the majors? Tell me about that. No, yeah, it's a lot, a lot different because when you get to the mayors, it's a, a lot of TV, a lot of cameras, you know, and those companies want them to use, uh, you to use the, their stuff, you know what I mean? And you're going to have some people that come, hey, can you use my stuff? And it's going to be it's gonna be a debate, you know, who will give you the more money, who will give you the more stuff. And sometimes, I mean, player now this day, um, they get, I mean, they're going to use whatever they feel comfortable. They get paid so much that they don't care about the money these days. I mean, if you, I, uh, if you, don't get me wrong, if you're a rookie coming up or whatever, you're gonna look for the money. But those big players, whatever, hey, if I don't feel comfortable with your stuff, I don't care how much you're gonna give me. They're gonna go with the stuff that they feel comfortable because I mean that's their money maker. You know, they right. gotta feel right. Right. But I mean, no doubt about it, you get more stuff in the big leagues. I mean, you look right, you look, I mean, you look left, you look right, and then there's a pair of batting gloves. I mean. Oh, I need this. Oh, this glove is, you got a glove in your lock. And I mean, it's a, a, lot of, a lot of things that you can get in the big league that you don't get in the minors, a lot of things. So let's talk about cars. You don't have to mention any names, but tell me some of the crazy cars or, or, or maybe your favorite car and some of the things you saw in the parking lot when you were playing. I was, sometimes I was, Kinda when I was a rookie, embarrassed to get in the parking lot because it was the cheapest car that you can see in there. It was, I mean, maybe thirty, forty thousand dollars car, and that was the cheapest one. But they were hooked. Everything have, I mean, rims, nice stuff. I mean, from those people that um, were getting from there for a long time. I mean, you go to the, the you know, on TV show, they go around the parking lot and you see the crazy stuff. Like, I mean over there in spring training, and they shoot of uh, some of these cars that the players came in. You see from Ferraris to, I mean, whatever you can think. I mean, it's kind of like a car show. That's crazy. Now, what about some of these guys who have the bigger contracts? Do they take care of the rookies? Like, do they look out for you? How does that work? Yeah, I mean, they're always in, in a team that when you, I mean, come in, there are some those veterans that they've been in the game for a long time. They take care of the rookies for sure. They, they feel feel them. I mean, w welcome to the to the team. They help them. They buy. I mean, toots for the for the rookies. They, they in every team there is always some veterans that will take care of the, the rookies always. And what about, talk about the pitcher-catcher relationship. Like, were you really close with some of the pitchers on the team? Again, you don't have to mention any names, but um, did you form relationships with them? Because you're doing a lot of work for these guys, you know, helping them with bullpens and, and, and obviously catching them in the game. And obviously when a pitcher likes a catcher, there's kind of like a bromance there. Yeah, <laughs> no. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you're going to have those. It's like, like in every place, you're gonna have those pitches that they're gonna love you, you're gonna have those pitches that they're gonna hate you. 
I mean, it is what it is. I mean, you're not a hundred dollar bill, so everybody can like you. You know what I mean? But I mean, definitely, definitely, you're gonna have those pitches that hey, if you don't catch, I'm not gonna pitch. If you don't, if you're not in the lineup, I'm not, I'm not pitching. So and they get in, in the manager's office and tell them, uh, tell him about it and everything. But definitely, you're gonna have those pitches that anything, anything that 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 you do and anything that that it has to be. I mean, pitching later or everything, they're going to ask you for it. Anything. Like you said, I mean, they had that connection that if he's not with him, he's not pitching. Now, even, even, let me, let me ask, even though they're stuck pitching, they feel like, oh, if I don't have it, I, I, you know what I mean? Even though they, they're Hall of Famers, they feel comfortable with that person, and then let's say that catcher got hurt or whatever, and they pitch bad. They have in his mind. That's in his mind. Oh, I don't have my catcher. Right. Well, I know. I'll tell you from the pitching perspective. I have to, like, I feel like when I have a good catcher, it makes the biggest difference in the world because they know what I'm trying to do. They know my pitches. They know how to get pitches called. It makes me a better pitcher, and I feel more confident and comfortable when they're in there. So I get it. We talked about earlier in a video that usually the best hitting catcher starts because that's what the coach is like. But then by the end of the year, it's the catcher that all the pitchers like who's playing every day. Yep. So when yep. you can be a pitch, uh, pitcher's catcher, you know, you're going to get a lot of game time in there. Yep. Now let me ask you about this. We can cut this out if you don't want to talk about it. But I remember when we were training together, uh, one day you rolled up in this truck and you honked this horn and it was a crazy horn and it was this hooked up truck. Can you talk about that a little bit? or you know, no, yeah, yeah, that was a good friend of mine, good friend of mine, that when I was playing uh, that that year, he hooked me up with that car. I mean, and to this day, I still really appreciate uh, to to him because he helped me a lot. He helped me a lot, and he knows who it is, and I will say that I'm really appreciate, and I'm still I'm gonna be really appreciate what he do he did for me. And to this day, every, uh, if I see him somewhere, I mean, I still say that he was, he was one of the best. And let me tell you about the truck. It was sweet, mm -hmm. man. That thing had everything in it, right? The crazy air horn, it's a beautiful leather seat hooked up, beautiful paint job. It was amazing, man. That was the coolest yeah. truck I've, I've, I've seen. Um, talk about the transition now from playing in Major League Baseball to being done with the game, and then also getting into it as a coach now. What, did you did you go through any like depression or anything after playing? No, like like they always say. I mean, everybody that I talk to, they would say, hey, make sure you're ready. When I uh, did my decision to be a coach, I mean, everybody was telling me, hey, be sure that you want to stop playing. You don't want to have that on your mind. Oh, I shouldn't retire. I shouldn't do this. Be sure, and whatever made my decision easy was uh, my family. I mean, I always said, I mean, don't, don't get me wrong, but I always said that I wasn't going to go to play independent ball. I always said it when I was playing. I said, no, I'm not going to go there because, you know, that's, I mean, I'm going to, they don't pay you that well. I'm going to be, out of, I mean, away from my family. I'm going to be spending money to leave and everything. So when the time came, I think kind of was kind of like a, perfect timing and I was uh, they give me like a week to think about it when they asked me to be a coach and it only took me like three days three days to say I'm okay I'm, I'm going I'm gonna accept the, 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 jo the job and I don't regret it I don't regret it because I, my my mentality was always trying to help people people get better um, and to this day I don't regret it I mean you are one of the most generous people that I've ever come across. Uh, I remember one time you had me and my wife over for Valentine's Day and cooked us all this food and everything. And you were always helping me whenever you could um, when you were in the big leagues. I was still a minor leaguer trying to, trying to get there. And you were always very gracious and, and giving. And I think that's what makes you such a great coach is that you're always trying to give and trying to help the player, that's your main motivation. Um, talk to some of the coaches that may be watching this and help them understand what it is that can help them be a better coach, maybe some things that you've seen or learned along the years as a coach. Um, the only advice that I would give the coach is that 
remember that in the end of the day, the player is the one that's going to be successful. I mean, you're there to help him. Don't matter. I mean, if you, it's going to happen that that player is going to, if he's a good player or whatever, he's going to step up. He's going to go far. And don't feel bad if, I mean, if they all, oh, I mean, he don't remember me, whatever. But you know that you help that player get up there. And it, it, it's going to happen. I mean, even in college ball, I mean, minor league, uh, anywhere, anywhere. If you, if you are there, you're there for that player. I mean, no matter what, I mean, if you get paid, you know, in college or minor league, if you get your main job is those players. That's your main job. I mean, you got to forget about that you were playing or, or if I do this for this player, I mean, just do it. We know uh, um, expectation. Exa exactly. Do it with no expectation. Do it with no expectation. In the end of the day, if that player really appreciates, he's going to come back and say thank you. Right. That That's the main thing. And that's why it feel you, I mean, it's going to feel good about it that they come back. I mean, don't get me wrong, you're going to have those players that are not going to see it again and not even a thank you. But you know in your, in your, in your heart that you help that player. And you know in his heart, even though he didn't come to say thank you, he know that he, you help him. Right. I mean, the only thing that, that I can say is that you just give all your effort that you can to help someone. And in the end of the day, it's going to pay off. I mean, you're going to be a better coach. They even, if, maybe they don't say thank you to you, but they get, I mean, traffic to another um, organization. And he would say, oh, I know this coach. I mean, and your name is going to be thrown out there. That's how you get, I mean, no, I mean, everybody talking about you. You don't want, you want that in a good way, not in a bad way. Right. That's a great, that's a great piece of advice. And I think one of the reasons that I've been able to do so well on YouTube is because I, I just want to give as much information as possible. And I thank you and Andrew for coming on and talking and sharing information. Um, because I've found that the more that we can give and help the baseball community, the more that ends up coming back to us in return anyway. So uh, it's just been a, it's been a pleasure. So let's talk about this real quick before we finish the interview. You work with some of the best players in the game right now, you know, uh, the best of the best, but you also come home and you've got seven-year-olds to 14, 15, 16-year-olds here in your facility. What is some of the differences in working with those guys versus working with these guys? And uh, just how do you see that whole situation? I mean, it's a lot different. The only thing that you have to have is patience. Yeah. I mean, a lot of patience, you know what I mean? Because like we have some, yeah, seven, eight years old here. You're trying to, you, you gotta go away from that, I mean, mentality, that professional mentality and go in his mentality. You know that he just want to play around. And just you gotta find that uh, um, um, keyword or or something so that to transfer that information to them. I mean, it's kind of difficult, but it's not tough. You know what I mean? It just and I like it because you can sometimes those kids maybe listen more maybe to, than a grown up kid. The grown up kids sometimes think that they know it all. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But I like it, and, and uh, um, um, what I what I don't like sometimes is that the parents they respect too much out of the kid, yeah. and they're still kids. You know what I mean? They have to understand that they're still kids. They're still learning, and they're here because they want to have fun. They forget about that. I mean, it's like sometimes the parents get so upset that they think that from eight or 10 or 12 years old or even 13 years old, they're gonna go to the big leagues. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? They gotta stay, step down a little bit and let them have fun. I mean, work the right way, but I mean, don't live through their child. Mm -hmm. you know what I mean, you gotta let the child, I mean, play baseball and, and live by his own dreams. I see a lot of parents, they, they live by their child, so like they think that they are the baseball player. You know what I mean? Yeah. But besides that, I mean, I like to come here, and then some parents that I talk to them, they understand. And the first thing that I say when I come here, hey, you gotta, you gotta. If you're here, you're for a reason. You gotta let the coach coach. If you want to coach, 
I give you my shirt and you get in the field and then you do whatever I, 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 I do. But I mean, and then it's a, it's a uh, working process. You know, you're teaching the kid and you're teaching the parent too. In, in, I mean, there are some parents that don't listen. There are some parents that they understand. But I mean, that's the only, the only hard part is, I mean, is uh, maybe I think, I think to me, the parents. But yeah. I mean. That can be tough for sure. I know. And when I was coaching, that was probably the toughest part of it was managing the parents more than the kids. The kids were fun and, and easy, in, in, in my opinion. Um, you know, tough, challenging to help get them better. You know, it's, a, it's definitely a struggle. But the parents were definitely the, the worst part. You're a dad yourself. You have a son who uh, is an aspiring baseball player. What do you guys do uh, to work on baseball? Do you do anything with him or do you let others coach him? Or what, do you, what, what is your baseball relationship like? No, I mean, good. I, I coach him. And then, but I mean, if any coach get in, in the middle and say anything, I just let the coach uh, say whatever he, I mean, he see, because it's not only me, you know what I mean? Because he has to hear from somebody else. I mean, I don't, I don't know everything. I don't know everything. There are some, I learned some stuff from other people that they're not even, I mean, professional or whatever, because in the end of the day, I mean, you have to be open to everything. And the good, good coaches, they're open. If you are in that bubble that you think you're the best, you're wrong. You're wrong because you're always learning. You gotta be open. At the best uh, media and coaches are really open. They open to everything. Even though if they don't like the idea or whatever, they just analyze the idea and then if they don't like it, I mean, but they don't turn around. You know what I mean? They don't, oh, you don't know anything. Because I mean, the best coaches, you see best managers, they play in the big leagues, but they never were, they were stars. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You say, oh, where did this guy come from? I mean, uh, he studied the baseball. He, listen from everyone. And that's what those, those, the best coaches, you gotta be open. I mean, around, I can see a lot of coaches around, you know, in that travel boy industry that even though they play a little bit or they, parents know, they know, it, they know it all. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, but you gotta be open to everything. And then if you think it doesn't work, just find the information to see, because it might, it might work. Whatever it is, I mean, somebody's telling you or somebody show you or, or whatever you're doing is not working. I mean, you have to be open to anything. I, uh, I mean, I, the, the best coaches are, are, are open to anything. That's a great point. And, you know, I think you mentioned some of the superstar athletes that are never really get into managing. I think one of the reasons is because everything came so easy to them that they, they really didn't have to learn much through the process. Exactly. So guys like you who who really had to work really hard to get to where you got to, you had to learn everything that you could. Yes. Um, so now you understand what it takes to get there. Some of the guys who are just naturally good, just they, they it almost seems like they regurgitate what they were taught, even if it's right or wrong or whatever it is, it's, it's, it's usually harder for them to transition into coaching, at least I've seen in my experience. And I was the same way when I, when I left playing, I, you know, when I started to talk about hitting, I was saying the worst stuff imaginable about hitting because, first of all, I didn't know, but also I just reiterated what I was taught. But then as I became open and tried to learn more, I became a better coach and I tried to do, like you're saying, be more open. And I think that's why you're such a great coach. You were a great player. And I just want to say thank you for doing these videos and doing this interview. I think it was uh, very eye-opening to some some people and to all their cousins who play AAA. <laughs> um, really great information, and I'm always appreciative for everything that you do thank you, thank for you me for and me. for the game, and uh, thank you. Thank you for having me.